So each lecture, what I'm going to do is start by saying, here's the language thing I'm going to discuss. We'll talk a little bit about some like linguistic concepts to kind of get you thinking about maybe final project ideas or um, just like what is it that people have done the research on that then I can apply this analysis to. And then we'll do the analysis. So each week you're going to learn a little bit about the um, computational linguistics academic style research and then also some analytics approaches to answering those questions. And so the first thing we're mostly going to focus on is categories. Um, categories are super important. I think um, they're probably largely ignored in the sense of like there's a lot of theory behind categories that I think if you understood the theory a little bit and like if I can teach people a little bit about the theory that might help inform analyses a bit better. Um, we'll talk a little bit about category structure and their theories and then run, take that and apply a conditional inference tree to it. Okay. So I'll try to convince you that categories are really good to know about starting now. So what is a category? Well, it's a group or an organization of related things, okay, related objects. Um, in uh, uh, like uh, Amazon cares a lot about categories, right? So they have all these different um, labels for different types of things. Search engines, keywords are interesting uses for categories. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, if you have, if you're working for a company that does support tickets, right? So people file a complaint or a problem or an issue, and you assign those to a specific label you're dealing with categories. So categories kind of influence a lot of our day, honestly. Um, and within categories, what we have are, are members of categories. Right? So I con so generally these are called concepts. So category might be dog, concept here might be beagle, and that's the little dog in the corner. Uh, so animals, we have dog, cat, fish, bird. And these were all structured in such an interesting way. Now there's a lot of, con not controversy, this will be very dry, boring controversy, but there's a lot of uh, theoretical debate about this, but generally there's, um, people consider this kind of three-part structure. There's a superordinate level, it was more abstract. So I could say, I have an animal. And people would look at me like, what? <laughs> okay, great. Um, <clears throat> For uh, basic level naming, this would be the one that you would use more commonly. And you might say something like, I have a dog. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, we were trying to get her to go get dinner. She was snoozing really hard. Where are we at? So instead I might say, I have a dog. That makes more sense. People would be like, great, good for you. But then I could go into a subordinate level uh, category of level name and say, oh, I have a beagle. Right? And so this depends, this like level structure piece depends on where you're, where you're talking. Like it wouldn't be that unusual to say, I have a computer. Okay? Most people would be like, mm-hmm. And so I have Mac. That would be more subordinate, more specific. Um, I have a machine would be a little unusual to say. So basic level names are really um, cognitively very interesting because these are the labels that most people give things. So if you ask people to label their furniture, these would be the general like chair, right? table, desk. Um, and basic level names are the ones we tend to use when speaking, the first thing that children learn, etc. Um, and so it presents a really nice place to do search engine optimization, uh, not like practically like learning the tricks there, but like um, these are the types of words that people are more likely to search. So it's useful to understand the structure. There's an entire set of dictionaries called WordNet that actually capitalize on this idea of this structure. All right, so I'm going to talk about um, a couple of different theories here, and then we're going to see if we can apply those theories to the data that we have. And so the way that we form categories, right? So, uh, you know, Amazon capitalizes on the fact that we have these sort of internal categories like books and then like 
uh, young adult fiction and like um, what is it? Uh, fantasy novels and sci-fi and all these things, right? Um, are based on the way that we perceive the world. And so uh, people can argue over what is and not is and in, is not in a category. And so I always um, enjoy when people get into arguments over what is and isn't fantasy uh, fiction, because um, people seem to have very clear rules on that they seem, seem to think apply. But very practically, brain-wise, we do this because it's more efficient. And I think I said this last week that the like one thing that I used to teach my um, undergraduate courses when I taught this without all the numbers uh, is that we don't like to think that hard. And so categories are very efficient. They make the world understandable. It avoids a lot of duplication. I don't have to store every type of dog. I have like one representation, dog. All right. And then there's maybe some filters for the subordinate, more specific level names. And there's a bunch of ways that we learn these. And so we'll cover these very briefly. People have written entire novels on this stuff. But I think you'll see how this can be informative um, for uh, specifically I'm going to focus on, on keywords and search engine kind of stuff. But this is really useful anytime you're trying to give something a name. Right? And this will lead us to things like cluster analysis and categorization tasks um, where you're trying to get um, give things a label, you know, supervised learning kinds of tasks. Okay. So we're going to look at featureless theory, probabilistic theories, prototype and exemplar is really kind of one big theory now, and then theory theories, um, which are more about learning rule-based structures. So featureless theory was really the first big theory on categories and category learning. And it's um, a little bit of where I do my research. I don't really do my research on this theory per se. I do my research using this idea. Um, but our understanding of the world and, and um, semantic meaning, knowledge, right, is based on these like little checklists. Sometimes it's called checklist theory. So. I love to ask people what they think things are, and zebra is my example that I just need a shirt that says, like, what is a zebra? Um, so we will ask people, what, what makes a zebra a zebra? Tell us, right? The first thing that people will come up with, stripes, right? Zebras have stripes. That's clear. It's a nice visual characteristic. They're also kind of like horses, right? Um, and then people pick up adjectives, too, and they're mean. And so these are usually considered defining features. They are essential to that concept. To make it that thing, it has to have stripes. A zebra without stripes is a horse, right? Um, and then there are things that are characteristic of that thing, right? They're most, for some reason, people have it in their head that zebras are mean. <laughs> um, they're not like horses, they're wild, so they will bite you. Uh, and these are things that are usually true, but not always. The zebras are generally black and white, but sometimes they are brown and white. And so that's a really easy theory. How do, like, okay, people's knowledge is stored as this list of required features. So when I go to Amazon and I'm looking for a new dog bed, I, I have a specific set of features that I'm looking for in that. It needs to be plush. Um, maybe the dog waits. So if you look at how people organize their listings, what you'll see is they all tend to list the same general sets of things, right? if they're popular ads. And that's because they know people are searching for that defining feature. And so uh, a popular academic task is just ask people to judge something true or false. So in a sentence verification task, you might see something like a dog is an animal. And all you have to do in this task is very boring. Undergraduates love this stuff. It's just like true, false, true, false. And what we think is happening when people um, answer this task is that they're like, okay, I'm going to compare these two things. I'm going to calculate mentally the feature similarity. So I have my dog list of features, my animal list of features. Do they match? If the features match quite highly, 
the response latency is fast, meaning you just like quickly like, yes, true, true, true. If there's no overlap, the response latency is also fast. Space here, um, like false, false, false. So if I say a dog is a church, and you're like, what? No. Okay. However, then there's this middle ground of where the response latency is much slower. And that means that people are thinking about this a lot harder. So what do we think is happening when people are churning over the task a lot longer? And by a lot longer, I mean, we're talking like 100 milliseconds. Like this is still pretty quick uh, in the brain. Um, but that really tells us that there's this like fuzzy boundary. Right? So if I said a wolf is a dog. No, but sort of. They have all the same features as dogs. That's the wild animal part. And wolves are actually much bigger than you think. Um, but there are some really big dogs too. So a wolf is a dog. All right, so that takes a lot longer for people to decide if those things are true or false. And what that really shows us is this overlap between categories. And so then that led to a set of models um, that focus instead on probabilities. And I would say that these are still pretty, are still used in network type models. And what we get is these like core descriptions. Okay, so there's some sort of concept and there's core description, um, <clears throat> excuse, excuse me, based on the probability of that feature. And so the probabilities of features are no longer yes or no. So a bird has wings, a bird flies, a bird has feathers. Instead, it's like more like 92% of them have feathers, right? And like 98% of them fly, minus those ostriches and those penguins. Right? And so you have these sort of probabilities on how much that statement is true. And so features are weighted by saliency and their probabilities. So what the heck is saliency? Oops, sorry, I thought I had it right here. Um, saliency is like visual, distinct, not distinctiveness, that's a different thing. Importance, right? So back to zebras. The stripes on the zebra are very salient because you can see them. Right? Zebras also have hearts. That's pretty important. If they didn't have one, they wouldn't be alive. But no one lists these things, right? So there are definitely features of of words that are really kind of required, but people never list. People will list they have hooves because that's pretty different from having just legs um, or feet, but they don't really list that they have hair. They do, but that's not very salient because lots of animals have hair. It's you know, like a mammal thing, like moving on. Okay, So um, we always have to deal with this fact that there are plenty of things that are part of our semantic knowledge that people just don't think about. Okay. <clears throat> so some issues with these, these models that are still pretty accurate is while well, you can ask participants to tell somebody what is a defining feature, there's a lot of disagreement, there's a lot of fuzzy boundaries for things, individual experience matters, right? And none of these models handle this sort of intercorrelation between features. And this is a key problem we'll have with lots of things all semester because language is often broken down into these little distinct units words right sentences and we just kind of move along as if those things are not somehow related so a lot of models break things down into individual words that's fine except that the order of those words is highly probabilistic 75 percent of languages are subject verb object no matter which way you read them, and uh, that's really predictable. So if we break them down into their individual words and analyze it one word at a time, we're ignoring the fact that they have a pro probable order. Right? And so these models ignore the fact that there's this sort of cl clustering. So every animal is going to have similar features because they're all animals. And then the other problem that's really sneaky that happens is if you ask people the same question two different ways, you get two different answers, which is really annoying. Um, so if something like, is Robin a bird? Okay. Uh, yes. Okay. 
is a bird a robin? Well, that's not even really good English, but like if you ask someone the basically the exact same question with checklist theory, it's just a checklist. It shouldn't matter which order you do the checklist in, but you do get get a different answer. That's bad. So instead, these models to me are like the most popular, um, and honestly, probably the most the best representation of what we're doing. And they're called family resem the family resemblance models. This covers both prototype theory and exemplar theory. They really started as two different things that kind of came together and then broke apart again. These people will never stop arguing, but they're basically kind of both probably a little bit accurate. Um, where a prototype is an abstract idea of the representation of a category. It, much like prototypes, if you think about like cars, are kind of like, here's an abstract concept of a car, and that's practically not what a real car is going to look like when we finish it, but here's kind of a fun version of it. And what we think prototypes are is this combination of a repeated experience. Okay. So back to Amazon. Let's say we're going on Amazon and we're searching for, um, what's a good example? New, uh, a TV, a TV wall mount. TV, <laughs> okay, that's creepy. All right, so TV mounts here. I had in my head an idea of what that should look like. And so what I see here is like, like in my head, I'm trying to find the one that best mount matches what I think one should look like. Okay. Um, and so prototypes are kind of this representation of a lot of different experiences, but they, the picture in your head may not match what's actually available in the real world. Instead, it's just kind of a, a, a amalgamation of things. Exemplar theory is the opposite. Okay? It's that we have a specific example we are looking for. Okay? There is this very specific type of mount that I'm looking for. And that picture is going to help. Um, or a better example might be like clothing. Right? If I just go in there and I'll look like a fancy party dress. <laughs> And then we get like all these different types of pictures, but maybe you have a specific example that you're looking for. <clears throat> all right, and so this idea is this instantation principle, right? where what we're trying to do is match our specific instance um, to whatever we're currently looking at. So let's let's say let's do yeah, fancy dress. Why not? And so let's say I am trying to find this like very specific style of dress that I have pictured in my head, and I'm like looking at this picture going, does that match what I am trying to find to buy or not? Um, I, I love this like, it's like a super fluffy one. Um, but like that would be my thing, like oh I'm going for the fluffy ones here, right? Instead of oh I'm going for I don't. Uh, more of a skater side. Okay. And the, the concept of these is very similar. Okay. The, the core distinction is it, is it an average or an abstract concept we're comparing things to, so our mental image of it comparing to what we're looking at on the screen, um, versus a, a specific example. Okay. And if you know what approach people are using, that's how you can help get them to your products, for example. <laughs> and so all we do is, say, is this the thing I want to buy? I'm matching it to my, my stored example. Okay. And a lot of that is done by using schemas. Okay. So schemas are a way that we kind of organize knowledge. I think schemas work best for restaurants, actually. And um, so you have, which is kind of hard right now, considering everything's closed, but uh, you have a schema for fast food restaurants. You know what to expect, right? You know you're gonna go in, you're gonna go up to the counter, or at McDonald's you can check on the super crazy screen things. Um, you're going to fill out your order, they're gonna bring it to you on a tray. Okay, you would not expect a waiter there. Okay. 
Um, oh, let me finish this train of thought and we'll come back to your question, your comment here. Uh, let's say I also have a schema for sit down restaurant, right? I'm expecting um, a, a waiter or waitress to bring me a menu. They're going to take my drink order. Then I'm going to order food. And then they're going to bring me food, right? And then you have a moment where you travel to a different country and you realize like how different things are. So one of my first like trips overseas, I just like was like, wow, this is a really different experience like <laughs> to eat food in different countries because of very different rules. Okay. And so where features come back in from our features theories earlier is that features help us fill in these little rules, right? So I have my category label, fast food restaurant, and then I'm going to have those kind of features to help fill in that schema. Okay. No waiters. Uh, back to your example. Both are examples. We have the type of experience. Yes. So with prototype theory, it's a bunch of experiences averaged together. But the exemplar theory is one experience that you are comparing to. So, yes, you are correct. But the idea is which one should it be? Um, and so if we take these ideas, now we can use that sentence verification task to understand if people are comparing to a prototype or to an exemplar. And what we find is that the concept members themselves, so if I have you ranking restaurants, for example, things that are more prototypical of fast food restaurant, McDonald's, okay, um, are rated faster. So if I ask someone, let's say McDonald's is a fast food restaurant, they're going to say yes very quickly versus if I said, what's kind of a uh, non-prototypical fast food restaurant. I don't think I have a good example. Sonic, maybe, since you don't go inside, right? Um, that's going to be a little bit slower because it's not as prototypical, okay, or it's not as exemplary. So now we know that the features themselves are probabilistic, but so are the concept members. And that's important because not only the, pe the features themselves, some are more likely than others, the concept members are some are more likely than others. And so theory theories, kind of our last set of, of rules here, are based on the like kind of a miniature um, set of rules on, based on the way the world works. And this set of theories is really meant to describe how we know that all these things are related, right? So these are all related because they look fancy of the material maybe because of the style like a theory here would be based on the style and the length um, most fancy dresses so to speak tend to be uh, long okay, not all of them but most of them and a lot of them have lace and so what we would say is that I've made a, a theory about the way the world works if it's a fancy dress it must have these things as is sort of like a dictionary okay? And really, this set of theories is based on children. Because if you ask children, like, how do you know that that's a horse and not a cow? Because these are very visually similar to children. Um, they will tell you a set of rules. Well, you know, you can ride a horse, but you can't ride cows or something. They come up with rules for these things. Um, and this set of theories was designed really to understand relationships between categories, whereas everything we've just been talking about is understanding the relationship between concept members. So things already in the categories. Okay. And so we're going to cut, we're going to like take this set of ideas and expand over the next couple of weeks on categories and what I'm going to call semanticity. And by semanticity, I just mean meaning. Okay. So anytime you see the word semantic, just remember that it means meaning. Well, meaning changes based on what we're talking about. So you do the meaning of that word or um, kind of like the understanding of what you're reading, right? So we can think about individual word meanings or um, kind of global text representation. What does this thematically represent? All right, so how can I take that theory stuff, turn it into something I can use? Well. What we're going to try playing with tonight are conditional inference trees. 
So conditional inference trees is a, is a type of kind of mini logistic regressions and a classification kind of scenario, an unsupervised classification scenario, so to speak. Well, I guess it's supervised. I don't know where you put this in the sort of machine learning classification rules, um, but the idea here is to take the predictive um, variables and figure out how each category is separated out by those. So these are kind of like decision trees um, but the math is a little different. Okay. So what we do is we have some sort of dependent variable. So the dependent variable here is going to be a uh, by an outcome. That's not binary. It's um, categorical. Right. So uh, we're gonna have an example on the word choice here, but on the homework, I think it's nerd versus geek. How do I know when would people use each word? What are the distinguishing features that separate those categories? And then we take our IVs, our predictors, and we see how can I split my independent variable so that it best predicts each category group. Now, if the data is categorical, the IVs are also categorical, it splits them along category lines in a binary way, meaning there's only two paths, it could be this or that. Um, Categorical continuous data might then pick a cut point. We're going to do this on completely categorical data because it makes the most sense. Because if you have continuous data predicting a categorical outcome, logistic regression makes more sense. And it continues this kind of like biggest split until there are no more splits. So this is called a conditional inference tree because we pick the and inferences are conditional um, to what is the current data set. I'll explain that a little bit more in a second. And it looks like a tree because we start at the roots and create branches. So the advantage is to a conditional inference tree over a decision tree is that um, uh, there are both types of recursive, what's called recursive partitioning, where we take the data and we split it up, and then we analyze the splits and split that up, and we analyze those splits and split that up until we're out of splits. Okay. This particular type that we're going to do is, well, in theory, it says it's less biased. Okay. And so sometimes decision trees are chosen by variables that can be split the most. And this picks the the variable that has the largest predictiveness first. Okay. A conditional inference tree does not need to be pruned as much as decision trees need to. So uh, you'll see that when we compare the R version to the Python version, uh, you'll see that the trees require less pruning. Okay. Hey guys, don't start a fight. Okay? I don't have any food. I'm getting <laughs> pestered. All right, um, and then we'll also get p-values for all of the splits. So you'll know which splits are significant, so to speak. Now this is a permutation test. So um, for p-value, to get those p-values, we're going to use permutations. So I always find that people understand bootstrapping and then confuse it with permutations or the other way around. So I want to talk about what those two things are. A permutation means that you take the data that you have and scramble it. And when you scramble it, you don't hold on to the row relationship. So you essentially sort the data in a random order for each row and column. That makes the data uh, randomized um, in the sense that participant one is not participant one anymore all the way through. So their data is just scrambled. We calculate our statistic, and then we count how many times that effect is present in the rearranged data. So much like traditional hypothesis testing, we want to find small numbers here because we want our results to not show up in the randomized data. If our results match the randomized data, that implies that our data, that our results are random. Okay, so we still want small p-values, but we want them because that implies that our results are what they are and not a random assortment of the data. That is very different from bootstrapping, 
Bootstrapping is like the lottery. You take the ball out of the um, hopper, but you put it back. So bootstrapping is where you sample the data with replacement usually and create data sets that look like your original. Permutation is where you scramble the data where it no longer looks like the original. Okay, so the, the goals for permutation, the goals for bootstrapping are very different. But I think people, because it involves randomizing the data set in different ways, um, get these confused. And so to do the permutation, we're going to build a random forest. And the random forest, because as part of the permutation stuff, it's randomized. Forest, because we're doing trees, so very cute names here, um, allows us to think about variable importance. So averaged over many of these trees, um, how important is that variable? This is much like uh, an effect size. So it's akin to the idea of partial variance. How much variance in the data are we predicting? And both conditional inference trees and forests are useful when the, what's called the data is sparse. We're going to talk about sparsity problems all semester. Language data is sparse. Sometimes people, and that means it's just a small data set. Sometimes that means the uh, conditional combinations are small. And so if I take a bunch of categorical variables and I calculate a very big frequency table, meaning what's the combination of all of these variables at once, there's a lot of zeros. And that data is non-parametric because it's categorical. And this analysis really doesn't require a lot of assumptions to the data. It's just that the data can be split somehow. So let's try it. Right? So the package for this is called Party. Thanks, um, And then also install Arling. Now, I install Arling by downloading the tar file and um, choosing it for my computer, but on the first assignment I have some code that you can use where you're downloading it from the Open Science Framework. I've just got it uploaded so it's easier for us to download and install. Um, and then don't forget, very helpfully, um, someone sent me a, hey by the way this package doesn't exist anymore. They took it off CRAN in February, so of course they did. Um, it's very similar to installing like this. So we're going to use this MIMnet package at the end of the semester. Um, it should still run. If not, we'll update the notes. Uh, so don't forget that when you're working on the uh, first assignment, that there's going to be a special installation for that package only. It's not listed already in the notes. So I've opened everything and then it's helpfully told me that it's loaded with all this other stuff. Great. What is the data set? Well, the data set is one we'll use several times. Okay. Uh, your R session aborts when you run which line? Me doing this. Um, I don't know is my answer, so uh, if you will tell me what you mean by aborts, we'll come back to this at the end. Oh, yeah, but what do you mean aborts? Like, if you can give me the exact error message, we can tackle that at the end of class. Um, where was I at? I'm going to save that. We'll save that one towards the end, but don't let me forget. Where am I? Where am I? Oh, category instances. Okay. So um, the dependent variable in this example is going to be, um, I don't know is my answer. I will percolate on that. We'll come back to it. Uh, where am I at? Category instances. Uh, all right, so this is a set of what is called causative constructions, meaning when people are choosing their type of verb, right, they might pick uh, make, have, or cause. And so causative constructions are, are, are useful for narratives and people understanding what's happening in text. And so, um, <clears throat> We use them quite a lot in English. There are causative constructions in every language. Just these are the ones for English. And so we might want to know when people are going to pick each of one of these types of words. 
So the IVs here are, well, maybe it's the semanticity of the actor. Is the person doing the action uh, animate, meaning breathing, moving, uh, or inanimate, like rocks? Uh, the semanticity of the thing being acted upon. So I um, made lunch. Lunch is inanimate. The semanticity of the event, it's either mental, physical, or social, right? So it's a thinking thing, it's a touching thing, or it's an interaction. We could think about if it's a negative, I, can, I cannot have, I can, uh, did not cause, that kind of stuff. If it's a co-reference, I did the thing to me, so I made myself lunch, uh, versus others, I made everyone lunch. And then is it possessive? The sentence include a possessive or not? And so the usefulness of this type of code, or this type of quest, uh, the data set would tell me when I should use each of those verbs. So if I'm trying to train a model that uh, responds or writes a movie script, that's really popular, like joke task, um, which one should I choose? Um, like I have lunch is clearly a different sentence than I made lunch. So uh, I might think about the uh, these uh, variables in the rest of the sentence to know which one I should pick. So let's look at that. <clears throat> that data set is in the Arling package. And it's just called cause. There are actually nine different DVs in there, so I'm going to just subset that data set. If you like um, tidyverse and love filter, go nuts. Uh, but I love the subset function. Uh, and I'm just going to say, give me make, have, and cause. Okay. And that's only because there are other ones in the data set. And I just want to look at these three. And then I dropped the rest of them, so it wouldn't try to predict empty categories. It's a bigger, there we go. I also set seed. Set seed gave me so much grief today. <laughs> set seed and I are not friends today, but um, you do want to start with a random number generator. Now, I think generally, if you don't set this, that's fine, but it's helpful if you know which seed you set so that you can recreate your results later. Although, honestly, for these, I usually get the same answer every single time. Anyways, it helps if you start with a, a, a random number generator so your results, results are reproducible. Okay, and then the function we're going to use is C tree here for conditional and function trees. And our DV here is the verb choice. Approximated by, that's the tilde that's above the uh, tab key on a QWERTY keyboard. And then we predict it with all of our variables. This code here, since all of you have had 500, is exactly the same way we do linear modeling. Okay. So y is approximated by x plus x plus x. So here are IVs and DVs on the right, uh, left, that's the left, the DV on the left, IVs on the right. Uh, and then what data we're going to use, because I'm using my reduced data. Then, I love this, ah, R makes this so easy, plot that output. Okay, so here's the tree. In a minute, we're going to look at Python, you'll see that it's not this easy. Okay. Now, I do have some problems sometimes when I print these and they're really big, that it doesn't show me the whole tree. So I'm going to come over here, I'm going to do this, and I usually have to like blow it up and then like zoom out. So now it's very difficult to read, but you can see the bottom now. Okay. And so what it does at the bottom, I'm going to start at the bottom and, and then go back to the top here. The bottom here tells you which category it was and the frequency of the category in that split. So I have cause, have, and make across the bottom. So this split over here is mostly the word make. So now that we've seen that, let me go back to the easier to read one. And so what's happening first? Well, this first bubble is the first piece that it's split on. So it took the data set on semanticity of the actor and broke it into animate and inanimate. 
because it's categorical, so it's easy. Okay. And that is the best predictive split. So everything over here tends to be an inanimate. Um, the dog made a mess, right? Oh, wait, that's not inanimate. Um, the car made me angry. Everything over here is animate. Okay, now the dog made a mess. Then it took those data sets, only the inanimate ones, and broke it down again by the type of event. Is it mental or physical and social together? Now this is the binary part. It only splits twice. So it groups together the ones that are most similar. Uh, over here, it's, it found the same, approximately the same split. Um, the numbers here represent what split it is. So one, two, and then this is five, I think because this is uh, one, two, three, four, and here's five. Okay. Um, but that's the same variable second, but notice that it split it in a different way. So this one's either mental or physical and social. And then one more split over here that makes this predictive into animate and inanimate actees, so the thing being acted upon. Okay. So animate, social, and animate tends to be its cause, have, make. So my interpretation would be to look at which bar is the highest, okay, or in this scenario, they're equal. So this is, I've already forgotten, make, make. So the choice for make is when it's mostly inanimate and mental. A little bit more over here where it's animate and social to inanimate. The uh, choice for cause, and it's clearly the only time that cause is like the winner, is inanimate physical events and social. Sorry, this is mental. Uh, these features here are not distinguishable. They're equally used. So this is that fuzzy boundary idea. This is all these categories overlap in this scenario. So they all share this feature together. And then over here, this is where have comes in. So have is clearly an animate social event with other animate objects. Right? I have to go hang out with friends one day. All right, so the interpretation here, I'm just kind of summing all this up, is the tree includes all of our possible significant splits. Okay, it does not split it until there's no more splits. It splits it until the permutations show that there are no more significant splits. The ovals are the names of the variables with that best split, and the splits are shown on our branches. This is the tree analogy. The bottom bar chart shows you which one it was. So if you were trying to categorize, here are the variables that predict. And for our, our category, um, uh, relating this back to our theories on categories, this tells us which features are most important for each of those categories. And so you could do this with your with products. Okay. Um, you know, have three similar products and see which feature it is that distinguishes them, okay, if at all. All right, so summary of like the actual graph. So later you were like, what was she talking about? The first splits between acti actors, the second splits on the type of event. And so what we see is make is mostly mental inanimate events. Cause is mostly physical or social inanimate events. Versus each verb being equally kind of representative of animate mental and physical events and make having sort of a second representation. So here's the cool thing about make. We know that words have multiple meanings. Now I can see these two different meanings. So when I'm trying to write a program that disambiguates word meanings, now I know which one is which. If I see these events, it's this word meaning. If I see these other events, it's that word meaning. So this also could help us understand what are called polysemes. Um, and then have is mostly animate social action. But the real question here becomes like, how good is this model? Right. So uh, a lot of times we can build these models and we have to have some sort of measure of accuracy or effect size or something that tells me the model's worth anything. 
Um, there are plenty of useless models in the world, and I've made several of them, I'm sure. So just like how like log regression, what you can do is tabulate the the predicted group category against the actual group category and create essentially an accuracy score. And so what I've done is take a, ta uh, a table here and I've done predict based on my tree output, this is my saved model, and compared that to the actual data. So the diagonal here are correct answers. And so we'll, we'll talk about this kind of thing more, a confusion matrix here, but basically these are um, when you've got a match, so you want your numbers to be high here and low everywhere else. So the worst one we're predicting is have, we have some, some higher, higher mismatches for have than anything else. Now it could calculate the correct how correct each category is. That's where you get into like precision and recall, if you're familiar with those terms. But instead I'm just going to calculate the overall model correctness. So I take a sum of the diagonal and divide by the sum of everything. And if our model is 100% correct, everything is on the diagonal. And the model is 67% correct. That's not bad considering there are three options. And so a model that's just guessing would get it 33% right. So I think, you know, when I talk to a lot of the analytics people, kind of like, you know, split in each state, if you will, um, you know, models that don't predict at 90% aren't very good. I'm like, but that's true for things that are well known, like part of speech tagging. If you don't have a 90% predicted model, you, you aren't doing very good because we have very good representation for, for that. But if you're doing a new model or new something your company's ever done before, 67% might be excellent. It's better than you were doing yesterday where you had no percents. Right? So remember that uh, these numbers are always in context of what is kind of known about the world. <clears throat> and so to get one more thing, I don't know why, where, why is this way over here? <laughs> um, that we can use to kind of know what variables are best. So I know what variable is the most important. It's the first one that came out of my tree. And I know what variable is the next most important. It's the second one on the tree. But when they start to have separate branches, I, I, I kind of want to know, like, are, is, is variable number one and variable number two equally important and that could have flipped them? Or is it that this one's way more important than this one? So what we're going to do is create a random forest now. So C forest. This code's all the same as our tree. And then our controls here, um, I don't know why, this is way over here, but you, uh, what you tell it to do is to run a bunch of trees so you can get a forest, because this uh, analogy never ends. Um, and this is how many variables to start with. So it picks like two variables to always start with and then runs your tree. And this just allows you to kind of make sure that you don't run the same model over and over and over again. It actually tries to permutate through different models. Okay. And what I can do with that is grab what's called variable importance. Okay, so when you have many trees, you can calculate like essentially how many times that variable came up first. And what this number of this representation of this number is essentially kind of like a partial variance. So it's how much can I predict the DV? So there's not really variance in the DV, right? They're categorical. But how much can I predict in the DV given all of the other IVs? Okay, so if you're familiar with regression, this is similar to partial correlations. Um, these numbers tend to be small. And so I just like told it to print out. And then the interesting thing here is that the first one is pretty is twice as important as the rest. We knew these weren't important because they didn't come up on our tree. To me, the interesting part is that the next two variables down, even though the type of event was the second branch down, it's only marginally more useful than the semanticity of the ACTE. Okay. So these two here are roughly the same importance to our model. Okay. 
these two are roughly the same importance to the model, even though it looks like this one is probably third and last. Okay, well, it's third and close. <clears throat> and so this, to me, tells me something interesting about these two. They're roughly equal in their predictive usefulness. And so what I can do is make a dot plot of that. Okay. And this is just, like, more for fun. I don't, I don't know that I'd, like... And once your boss is just not very good at reading numbers, <laughs> this just kind of does like a race chart, so to speak. But I can tell these are all zero, these are roughly equal, and this is one is twice as much. So this is kind of just a nice way to um, make a visualization of those variable importance pieces. Now, I don't have a good reference point for you of what numbers are good here. They're more for comparison purposes. All right, so let me get through model prediction. And then, um, let's see, where are we at time -wise? I think, actually this might answer some of your questions. I don't wanna run over because that's obnoxious. So let me do this model prediction slide and then we'll take a brief reprieve and talk about um, computer errors that we're having. And we'll finish these last like six slides next time and catch up. Um, but there's not a whole lot to this Python section, but some of the, um, I know several people have had issues computer wise. Anyways, okay, so let's finish this model prediction section and then put this whole thing on hold. So uh, I can do a get a with the forest now. So we've done this with the tree. Now let's look at the forest. We can do this exact same code. So I'm going to predict using my forest output in comparison to my real data. And what I get is another confusion matrix where the diagonal is the interesting part. And so I'm doing a little better at have here, but doing a little worse here, I think. Um, but in general, this model is a little bit better. So by permutating over the model, I, I've gotten a little bit better predictiveness uh, by gaining about three percentage points. Generally, random forests are slightly better than one individual tree because they've seen the data many different ways. Um, not always. And so I, I think what you'll find on your homework is that the random forest will be slightly better. And what you could do is combine a tree and a forest. Uh, if the tree predicts one category better and the forest predicts another one better. All right, so let's pause there. We will finish these last little bit of slides uh, next time. No big deal. We're pretty close. Um, so let's hit up these error messages. Sorry, can you repeat how to read the table? Yes. Uh, okay, so the table here, this confusion matrix, this, these are the predictions, these are the actual values, um, but the, the main key here is the diagonal. Okay. So the diagonal is where you're getting it right. Okay. Um, it's a hit, so to speak. Uh, so I, it is cause and I predicted cause. Okay. Uh, or it is have and I predicted have. So it's um, predict versus actual. Uh, it doesn't really matter which way you do the table because the diagonal is the important. So I want to know how many times did I get it right versus the whole total. And these pieces here are where I'm getting it wrong. And so have is the one I'm getting the most wrong. Okay. Um, it's shifting over to make. Does that answer your question? Okay, okay, it's good. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so what we do is we take this sum and we take a sum of the correct answers and divide by the total. So I'm getting 71-ish percent correct when I predict them from my forest model versus the 67 percent from my tree. All right. A reminder last week that we covered conditional inference trees, right? So we were building that tree of like, if this and this, then have. If this and this, then make for our verb types. Now, the problem to, in comparing R versus Python here 
is that that uh, conditional inference tree, as far as I can tell, is not really implemented in Python. Instead, it's re a regular decision tree, which is more of a classification, sometimes considered machine learning. So <laughs> I just realized I'm like looking at the dog. They're supposed to eat this tree in this ball, right? And that ball makes it harder for them, slows them down. Well, he has figured out in like 20 minutes how to get it out of the ball. <laughs> He's currently just chewing it. I don't know who invents these dog treats. They have not met real dogs, I don't think. So anyways, distractions. Uh, where were we at? That algorithm is not implemented in Python. Much like the algorithm that dog treat makers use do not must not include brilliant hound dogs, right? So, or determined hound dogs. Let's compare last week's results to our decision tree classifier that we can build in Python and see what the, the differences are. Okay. All right, so to load that, I have to import scikit-learn, and the function is tree. Now, I've transferred the data here from R into Python, and since we haven't done this a whole, whole lot, um, don't forget that when you are moving data from R environment to our Python environment, you do R dot and then the name of the data frame. Um, you don't have to do that, but it's much easier if you just go ahead and transfer it over. Then the next thing that we have to deal with is the fact that this is completely categorical. Now, in R, the, the at factoring, kind of underlying commands, the control factoring um, are fantastic. They're some of my favorite things about R. So I don't have to, like, tell it, you know, make me dummy coded variables. It just goes, oh, it's a factor? Dummy code this stuff. Okay. Now, in Python, I have to tell it, make me a dummy coded variable because it's expecting... Um, it's expecting essentially uh, cat like number columns from its analysis. So technically, this get dummies is sometimes called one-hot encoding, um, where what we have is for each categorical variable, um, we have or for each categorical group, we have one column, and if it is that variable, it gets a one, and if it's not that variable, it gets a zero. Okay. One-hot encoding is different than true categorical uh, dummy coding although this function is called get dummies. Um, so uh, we will talk about that big difference in another chapter where we're going to use the same get dummies function. But for our purposes right now, one hot encoding works just fine. And so what we do is we say, okay, PD for pandas data frame. Okay, this is like Tibble. Uh, transform our our predictor variables into a, a set of categorical columns. Okay, so we got ones and zeros here. And then we transform our y variable into a, the same idea, a set of categorical columns. And so that's all we're having to do here is just convert them from uh, words to numbers. And then a general rule for most Python related things is you build a blank a blank model and then you fit the data to it. So here's our blank model. So our decision tree classifier. I'm going to do dot fit. This says conditional inference tree, although this isn't really a conditional inference tree, as you'll see, hopefully, if you can remember last week in a second. Okay. So conditional inference tree dot fit here. X comma Y. Now, I'm not doing this in a traditional machine learning format. I'm just fitting to the data. I don't want to test and train. Okay? I just want to fit, see what happens. Now, there are ways to get a pretty tree, um, but they require the GraphViz library, which was more complex than I cared to really show you guys because I think the one in R is so much better. So you can use this export text function to create the tree. And the main thing I want you to get here is notice how big it is. Our tree from last week was not this large. Oop. Okay. So here's our tree from last week where it had basically four variables that worked. 
Now the tree from this week prints out all of the variables. So notice here that it's including negatives and possessives and co-references. We found that those variables were not useful before. So the way you read this is like basically if the inanimate uh, variable is less than 50.5, which means it's a zero. So this, this inanimate column is zero, which makes it animate, which is a little confusing. Okay. Then here's all this stuff. Okay. And then the other split is if the inanimate column is one, which means that it is an animate variable, then do all this stuff. And then you keep reading the splits that way. Okay. So one reason I don't like the decision tree classifiers in Python is one, they would require pruning. So we would have to figure out and how to break, take off some of these branches that don't work. Our conditional inference tree that we used in R did not require pruning. It stopped when they were no longer significant. This model does uh, just branches until it can't anymore. So it use, you know, it just keeps splitting and splitting and splitting, even if those splits are not useful. Uh, and then also you don't get any p-values and you don't, not that p-values are the most important thing in the world, but you don't get any um, measures of how useful each variable is. Like this is, this is kind of it. Now there are more things that you can do with the decision tree classifier, but I'm really showing this as a comparison point that this is the conditional inference tree types of models are very different from decision tree classification algorithms. I can measure uh, kind of how good we did. Um, so if I use this in a prediction type way, uh, which would tell us kind of how predictive our model was, which we were able to get last week, okay. I can tell it to predict. Okay, so CIT predict my um, Y variable with my X's. Okay. And then I have to kind of do this weird conversion to get it back into a label. So what this does is this tells me here are what my columns are. So I have have, make, and cause, I think. Okay. And pick which column it predicted, and then kind of convert that back to the labels. Okay. So this piece here, all it's doing is taking a one-hot encoded table and converting it back into a factored table, okay. where I have one column of what group it would have predicted instead of this one-hot encoding. I can use a confusion matrix. So this is like using predicted versus um, actual. And I have the same basic, um, I mean, I could add these and figure it out, but I have the same basic uh, prediction. As you can see, here's what we did in R. Okay. We're doing a little bit better on this first one. The second one's about the same, and we're doing the third one about the same. Why doesn't the array print labels? I don't know because we have given them labels. Mm. Short answer is shrug. Sometimes it'll do it for me and sometimes it won't. And there's a better metrics. Uh, what's the metrics one? Classification results. There's a better function in scikit-learn's metrics package that actually will give you a much prettier version of this. And I'll be darned if I don't remember what it is right now. Um, that is what labels is supposed to do. You are right. What is the name of that stupid function? Give me a second. Mm -mm -mm, it's going to come to me. That's the homework. That doesn't do me any good. Two seconds. Oh, there's a much better function for this, but I need to look at my other class because we use it in the other class. Display table. All right, that's my parents asking about the dog. All right, uh, plot, no, not plot confusion, display. Not this one, the other one. model performance, not that one either. Wait, maybe it is. Ah, man, why is it not coming to me?
because we want to look at like the whole model curve thing. Hmm. Classification report. Oh, I didn't even see that you had typed it in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's try that. There's a couple of them that I really like, but I think that's the one I'm thinking of. Um, one second. Let me open the notes. Classification report. Open. Open. I just I keep trying to open the wrong one. Maybe one day my brain will figure out that it's the wrong one. Okay, there we go. So let's try that. Load this all up. How have you finished that thing already? Good grief. While that runs, let's see which one goes first. True predicted. True predicted. Well, that like printed pretty pretty poorly in this output, but if we hit knit, I bet it will run pretty nicely. Mm -hmm. We'll just it'll take a minute for that to knit. Mm. There we go. Oh, let's look at that. Do, 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 do. How close were we? All right. So this, um, why does it still print? Okay, normally this prints much nicer. So you can see it has like these slash ins in it. And it will um, print precision and recall and the accuracy scores. And it's still not the one I think I'm thinking of, but it will give you like kind of these um, uh, average scores and then a confusion matrix at the bottom. So I'll see if I can find uh, which one it is and add that to the notes and send you guys a little message. Because okay. it's not, classification report's a good one, but there's a way to see, um, see it with the confusion matrix. And I'm just not thinking of which lecture it is in my other class. Because okay. it makes these really nice tables. But either way, okay. What we can see is we get approximately the same results. How do I figure which one predicted better? Well, good question. So I could um, calculate the diagonal here, right, and create a percent score. So I could say 45 plus 38 plus 24 divided by the total. And so I have my um, accuracy measure, which I could also get from um, this kind of classification report if it printed correctly. And then we have our um, accuracy measure from here. Right? So we got about 67% with our model from last time. And uh, I could say, well, which one's better? I would say, though, you have to account for the fact that the Python one is much harder to interpret. Okay? And it doesn't have anything pruned. So you might think the variables are important, but they're really a waste of your time. And so in a business sense, I would only want to use the variables that are worth my time and money. And so this kind of model will tell you that will just give you every possible split. So you may not know which ones are worth the best time and money. But practically, you could go with just raw accuracy. So which one should we use? Well, R is much, to me, much simpler, makes much prettier graphs. Um, Python is more for this kind of test, train, apply kind of purposes with that qualification that we've already talked about. Uh, it's impossible to tell unless you predict on unmodeled data. See, that is a very, that's a great point. That's a very uh, analytics point of view. And what's funny is from a statistician's point of view that uh, obviously we always want cross-validation, right, which is what you're talking about. Uh, but if I think about, like, if I just want to know which ones predict, having one data set without splitting it is fine. Because I can see which variables are useful. 
better to run it on multiple data sets, right? Um, And I lost where I was going with that. <laughs> Cross-validation is always good. Uh, but we could, if we don't have multiple data sets and we don't want to split them because the data is small, we could say, well, these variables appear useful at the moment. Okay. And I could pick a model that has the best statistics from a group of models. Okay. Uh, all right, so with that, let's summarize. So we can really begin to think about features of categories, which is great because that's what we're going to keep doing in the next section here in a minute. Okay. Uh, we can create these conditional inverse trees and random forests. And so we can start to think about exemplars for each category and think about categories being very useful in terms of like product labeling, that kind of stuff. <clears throat> and the nice thing about this is that these, excuse me, models work really well with sparse data or data that has many potential interactions. So there's a lot of potential like kind of cross components for each variable that you wouldn't want to test and maybe logistic regression because it would get unwieldy very quickly. 